Hi, we're the Gary family. I'm John. I'm Allison. I'm Ryan. And this is Rocky. We're happy to join you in online worship today. One of my favorite verses is Isaiah 43 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Ryan and I have been members since he was about two years old, and John grew up here at Crestview. We love our Crestview family. Welcome, Welcome to, to worship. worship. Love that the uh, dogs are getting in on the act again. That's that's fantastic. I didn't catch his name. Was it Rayleigh? Riley? Rocky? Rodney? No, Rocky. Anyway, good morning. It's great to see uh, all of you here today, and to know that all of you are with us online every week. We are just so grateful that we can um, be together in so many different forms. As always, I've got a couple of quick things to remind you about. First of all, beyond the bulletin, that is the key. That's how you can know what's happening in the life of the church. You can sign up to get our weekly e-newsletter uh, by going to our church website. You can use beyond the bulletin not only to learn about our education and our mission, but also you can use it to sign up for Easter Sunday to let us know that you're going to be here. We want to have a good idea of uh, how many folks to expect because we're going to try to make it as safe as possible because God has blessed us so far. Uh, we've been in person since uh, early June, and uh, we want to continue to be careful, but also to have as many folks here as possible. So I'm told that our 930 service is almost full, so if you want to sign up for 930, you can do it by using Beyond the Bulletin, our website, you can email the church office, or there are some sweet ladies out in the narthex that uh, you can have sign you up. Now the 11 o'clock service still has some uh, spaces available. And just a quick reminder, it's the very same service. In fact, I was thinking that the 11 o'clock service will be the first time I have preached without a camera in a long time. And so I'm in some ways looking forward to that. Who knows what could happen? So anyway, 11 o'clock. Also, if you'd like to uh, receive our prayer list, we do have a weekly intercessory prayer list that goes out. Uh, in Beyond the Bulletin, you can see how to do that because we are, even though spread apart, we are a, a church family and a congregation, and we want to be able to stay in touch with each other. One other quick thing, it's uh, Palm Sunday, which means that uh, Holy Week is upon us. And one of the ways we will observe Holy Week is to have the middle sanctuary, if you're new here, that's the sanctuary just down the hall to my right, open all day long, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, and you can come in and go through the stations of the cross and spend as much time as you'd like, go at your own pace, but have... Uh, time for worship and so that's available and then also we have a Monday Thursday service that will be shared with you online at seven o'clock on Thursday that is a mouthful but I think I've covered everything I was supposed to and so let's now prepare our hearts to worship together and the passage that we will meditate on and pray back to God is from Jesus's triumphant entry into Jerusalem what we call Palm Sunday and so let's pray together This all took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Gracious God, as we meditate on your word, we remember the events of what we call Palm Sunday. And Lord, we recognize that you are indeed our king. That you providentially care for your creation and your people. That you govern your creation. 
Gracious God, that you provide for your creation. You care for your creation. We thank you that in Christ we have a king. But as we think about the events of Holy Week, Lord, we also recognize that you are humble and gentle. And so, gracious God, we thank you that when you deal with our lives and deal with our sin, you do so in a way that is forgiving and redeeming. And so, Lord, now as we prepare to worship you, we ask that you give us fresh eyes to see and ears to hear your good news. Prepare us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Among the things that we can bring as we prepare to come and worship God might be our worries and our thoughts about the week and uh, finances, health, uh, the future. What, what are you worrying about? Well, we also come with hope to a worship service, hoping to hear a word of assurance, a word of peace, a word of hope. This morning, I want to remind each of us that Jesus offers this word. And in today's scripture, we'll hear that Jesus reminds us that we need not worry. If God cares for the birds of the air and the grass of the field, won't he equally care for each one of us? We come to worship to remember that God knows our every need and will provide. He is, as Sarah will sing here in a minute, our hope uh, for years to come, our help in ages past. So let us worship God this morning, offering him our praise, our thanks, and our adoration. Thank you, Sarah. A couple years ago, we talked about the college admission scandal. You remember having that conversation? And that's something that uh, I've been interested in because it's such a, a study of human nature and so revealing about our culture. And now there's a documentary out 
called Operation Varsity Blues, the College Admission Scandal. And so we watched it last week, and I could not take my eyes off of the computer screen. What an amazing story. So if you're not familiar with it, uh, a number of elite families in this country, very wealthy, wanted their children to get into elite colleges. And many of these children were not able to get into those colleges. And so a man named Rick Singer hatched a plot. Here's what he knew. He knew that essentially there are two ways that someone gets into a college, especially an elite university. One is through the front door. You make great grades. You have great test scores. You have all the extracurricular activities, and you get in. But he also noticed that there is a back door, that if your child does not qualify for a Stanford or one of those elite schools, if you will give that school, I don't know, let's say $30 million, they might find a space for that particular student. But, no, but <laughs> so many families couldn't afford that. And so here's what he discovered, that there is actually a side door. Hmm. Maybe we could bribe college administrators and college coaches of some of the more minor non-revenue sports, sailing and crew and water polo, we could bribe them, maybe $200,000, and also we could have someone who is proctoring the SAT or the ACT cheat on those scores, and maybe these students can get into these elite schools. Now, I need to go ahead and, uh, full disclosure, I myself attended an elite university, the Western Kentucky University affectionately known as the Harvard of the South. And we did not have to cheat or give $30 million for me to get into that school. However, a number of these families did. Well, they got caught. And it was amazing to me how many of them went to prison for like six months. These wealthy, prominent people were willing to risk it all in order for their kids to get into the right school. Isn't that amazing? Six months in prison. And what I found really interesting as I watched the whole show was how anxious these young people are. Amazing to me. When they did not get into the school of their choice, they went into hysterics. And of course, those hysterics spread throughout the entire family system, and it was really sad to watch. And I know this is true for a lot of our young folks. I've got a buddy of mine whose daughter, they live in another city, whose daughter wants to get into an elite school in that particular city. But she doesn't want to get into an elite college, and she's losing sleep over this, you all. She doesn't want to even get into an elite high school. She wants to get into an elite junior high. And she's having trouble sleeping at night. There's a lot of anxiety out there, isn't there? And Jesus has a lot to say to us about anxiety. He has a lot to say to us about how we should avoid it. He wants to warn us of what it will do in our lives. I mean, I think about it in this way. Have you ever been on the interstate driving? Let's say you're going south on I-75, and you notice northbound there's a huge crash, and traffic is backed up for miles and miles and miles. And as you drive by, you have a couple of thoughts. One, you pray for the people in the crash. Two, you think, I'm glad I'm going south and not north in that. But so whenever you get past all those cars, get past the standstill, you see cars going 70 miles an hour, totally unaware of what they're approaching, totally unaware of what lies ahead. And you think, oh, if I could only warn them Turn around, take another route, because you have no idea what you're about to encounter. When it comes to anxiety, Jesus is warning us, this is what lies ahead. This is not good for you. This is not God's design for your life. Now it's Palm Sunday, and we know the story. Jesus rides into Jerusalem, the holy city, and he knows what lies ahead. He knows about the crucifixion. He knows about the resurrection. And as he pulls into Jerusalem, crowds are what? Lining the streets, waving the palm branches. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're excited. 
However, their excitement in just a few short days turns to anxiety because they discover this Jesus, he's not who we think he is. He's not the one who's going to conquer Rome for us. He's not going to vanquish that government. In fact, he's not going to do any of those things. And their anxiety about their future, their anxiety about their current state spills over into fear and then into anger. And several days later, what do they do? Crucify him. Crucify him. Anxiety is something a lot of us deal with. And I'm not just talking about the clinical anxiety. A lot of us have that and take medication for it. I'm talking about the anxiety over circumstances. The anxiety over what's happened in the past. The anxiety over what could happen in the future. In fact, the New Testament word for anxiety is translated a distressing or distracting care. I'm going to sit down. I'm missing out on my notes here. And so it's a distracting care. Any of you have that in your life? Something that is distracting you. Something that is causing you to worry. I know when I was in my 20s, and I've shared this with you before, um, I was healthy. Went to the doctor because I was having all kinds of stomach issues. I mean, I just couldn't sleep. My stomach was in knots. And so I went through the entire appointment, and the doctor said, hey, for your height, you're the right weight. Everything is perfect. Everything is fine in your life. However, your blood pressure is 150 over 120, and you're 27 years old. And he pulled his stool up to me and said, Sean, what's going on with you? And at that point, I had to start dealing with some anxiety that I had. What about you? Have you ever had that moment when you have this distracting care and it essentially renders you almost unable to function in life? Jesus understood that. So as we close our series on Matthew chapter 6, we're going to look at what he had to say to those who are plagued with these distracting cares. Those who spend their time just worried, worried about the future, worried about the past, worried about circumstances, totally distracted. You see, God doesn't want that for our lives. God knows that anxiety creates a lot in our lives. It creates fear. It creates sleeplessness. It makes us timid and fearful. None of the things that God wants. In fact, anxiety also hurts us, what, physically. I was reading an article the other day, health tips for men in their 50s. And I qualify for that. And so there were 10 tips for good health for men in their 50s. And number three on the list was reduce stress and reduce anxiety. Number three on the list, diet, exercise, stress and anxiety because it releases cortisol, we can't sleep. And whenever we reduce our stress and we reduce our anxiety, suddenly we're happier, we're fully functional, it affects our health. But what Jesus also wanted us to see is that anxiety affects us spiritually as well. Take a look at this quote. John Piper, great author. Notice the spiritual impact anxiety has. Think about how many other sins are connected to the root sin of anxiety. Anxiety about money will cause you to hoard or to steal. Anxiety about succeeding will make you irritable and impatient with those around you. Anxiety about relationships will make you withdrawn or indifferent toward other people. Anxiety about what others think about you will make you lie or even stretch the truth. If anxiety could be conquered, a mortal blow would be struck to many other sins. And so what I want to do now is just dive into the text, Matthew chapter 6. Let's start with verse 25. Jesus is teaching about anxiety. He starts out, therefore I tell you. Now when we read the word therefore, we know he's connecting us back to something that was said earlier. And so here he says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink. Don't worry about your body, what you'll wear. 
Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? And so he's pointing us back to what he had to say about treasuring. Treasuring things on earth rather than treasuring things in heaven. And he's saying essentially, the things that you treasure often are the things you worry about. Pause for a moment with me. Is that true for you? The things that create anxiety and worry in our lives really are the things that we treasure. And what I see here is Jesus saying, basically, anxiety reveals that we think too little about God. We don't think enough about God. We don't think that God can help, that God can care for, and that God can provide. Anxiety says to God, you're not able to do what I need you to do. I was uh, thinking about um, years ago, Davis and I used to go to Pittsburgh every year to watch Pirates games when he was in elementary school. That was our big trip of the year. And so we would go to Pittsburgh. We lived in Louisville. We would drive through Cincinnati and always go, wow, when we saw the skyline. Then we would stop in Lebanon at that skyline Chile, right off I-71. Have you ever been there? That's a great skyline. And then we would get on to Pittsburgh. And so we would get to Pittsburgh, and one year we checked into the hotel went straight to the baseball park. And as we were walking to the baseball park, my son, who was probably in fifth grade, said to me, are we not going to eat today? In my mind, here's what I said. No, son, I brought you to Pittsburgh to starve you to death. I said, have you, in my mind, I thought, have you ever been hungry before in your entire life? Have you ever missed a meal before? But what I said to him was, When we get to the stadium, you will have all these amazing options. Aren't we going to eat? When you and I have anxiety in our lives about what we're going to wear, what we're going to eat, about the things we treasure, in some some ways we're saying to God, aren't you going to do this for me? Can't you do this for me? Why haven't you yet done this for me? When you and I have this in our lives, this distracting care, it shows that we think too little about God. You see, God wants us to understand that He treasures you and He treasures me. We are of incredible value to God. And so take a look at verses 26 through 29. All right, Jesus goes on. Okay, so you're worried, you're anxious. Hey, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow. They do not reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Jesus is saying, yeah, God treasures the birds and treasures the flowers. How much more does He treasure you? Our anxiety not only reveals that we think too little about God, I think it also reveals we think too little about ourselves. That we are not worth God's care. That we are not good enough to receive God's care. God is blind to our needs. Several months ago, we talked about the word providence. And you remember the word providence. It essentially is a wonderful theological term that indicates God's care for creation that God governs creation, that God provides for creation, that God watches over creation, that God is involved in creation. We are not a bunch of deists sitting around in this room thinking that God just kind of created and just is letting it go. No, we believe that God is intimately involved on this planet. Yes, there are things that happen that grieve God, things happen that God does not like, but God is still governing this planet. He's taking us somewhere. And so he loves you and me. Here's the question, do you believe that? And do I believe that? Because if we do, how does that change the way we look at life? You know, sometimes it it occurs to me that I trust God to save my soul for eternity, but I don't trust him to take care of me here. And God wants to do both. God wants to provide for us I mean, I I think about, what is this, the the 28th of March. So, a little over a year ago, this whole pandemic hit. And there have been a lot of losses this year. A lot of uh, loss of life, loss of career, 
loss of home, loss of a dream. There have been a lot of losses this year, and it's real. But here's what I think. This year has been a great opportunity for you and me to grow in our trust in God and to develop that trust even further and to lean on God. I mean, as you and I look at this passage, just look at that. He's arguing from the lesser to the greater. He's saying to those folks, okay, you see those birds flying around? Do you hear those birds chirping? Do you see those flowers growing? Do you see those beautiful blooms? If God cares about them, how much more does he care about the crown jewel of creation? His humanity. Created in his image. No, when you and I spend a lot of time in, ang in anxious worry, we're essentially denying the fact that God cares about us. And we think too little of ourselves. Well, there's more. Verses 31 and 32. We're just walking through the text together. I love this. So don't worry saying, what are we going to eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And here's the key. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. God knows what we need better than we do. I mean, I think of the, the concept of unanswered prayer. I mean, have you ever prayed for something earnestly, repeatedly, and fervently, and that prayer not be answered to your satisfaction? It's happened. But have you ever looked back on that prayer and thought, I'm glad it wasn't? Because God knows what we need more than we do. We have to trust that. The, you know, the average American family, when a new baby comes, you got to do what to your house? You got to childproof it, right? So the average American family spends about $1,500 childproofing their house for the birth of their first baby. We walked across the street yesterday and saw a one month old, and they spent all this time and all this effort childproofing their house. Well, now there will come a time when that child will stand at the top of the steps and grab the baby gate. Anyone ever seen that happen? Yeah, I bet you have. And they rattle that baby gate back and forth. And they cry, and they want to go downstairs, and they cannot believe they can't go down those stairs. But the truth is, if they took one step, they would tumble all the way to the bottom. What are we saying to that child? We're saying, Mom and Dad, they know best. You don't know what you need, but we know what you need. In this text, Jesus is saying, God knows our need. Trust Him. And then finally, we conclude with verse 33. And what you'll notice here is that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about the negative and then the positive. You know, when you fast, don't do this, do that. When you pray, don't do this, do that. When you treasure something, don't treasure this, treasure that. And so in this same context about worry, Jesus does the same thing. He says, hey, I've told you not to worry. That's the negative. Let me tell you what to do. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these other things that you and I worry about will be added to you as well. Jesus says, put your energy in kingdom pursuit. Because if you're like me, we want to do something. I mean, when I feel anxiety, I want to do something about it. When I feel worry, I want to do something about it. Jesus is saying, here's how I want you to use your energy. Here's what I want you to do. And so, what do we do? Well, we pray for and look for God's kingdom. Whatever situation you find yourself in that I find myself in, we pray for and look for what God's up to. What's he doing in all this? I mean, I always ask myself, you know, God, what are you trying to grow in me? God, I'm, I'm concerned about this. What are you trying to produce in my life? You see, when Jesus was about to enter the holy city, at one point he found himself in Jericho. Jericho was a beautiful place. And there in Jericho, he came to a fork in the road. He could go north back to Galilee. That's his hometown. They like him there. He knows folks there. It's comfortable. It's peaceful. It's quiet. Everything will be okay if he went north to Galilee. Or he could go southwest into Jerusalem. And he knew what that meant. And yet he chose to go southwest into the holy city. Why? Because he had work to do. 
his trip into Jerusalem meant that you and I have been redeemed. His death on the cross means that our sins are forgiven. It's an illustration of God's incredible love and care for you and me. He did kingdom work. He did what he was called to do. And so when you and I are in a tough situation, what do we do? We keep praying. We keep seeking. We keep doing good. We keep serving. When you and I find ourselves feeling vulnerable with our health or our wealth, what do we do? We keep praying. We keep serving. We keep doing good. We keep going about kingdom work. Because if we can focus on those things, Jesus has said, this other stuff you're worried about, God's going to take care of that. You know, there is a lot of anxiety out there. And we see it not only in our young people, but we also see it in folks who are older. When I think about our our young people who are so anxious now, how's it going to be when they're adults? Because the stakes are much higher then. What's it going to be like if they're going into hysterics because they didn't get into the right school when they got to pay the mortgage, take care of a family, maintain a career? God says, that is not my plan. That is not my design. What I want you to do is seek first my kingdom and be righteous and trust me. So why don't we spend a few moments in prayer now and go to God with our anxieties And ask God to show us what he's trying to do in our lives and what he's trying to produce. And also show us what it means to be about his kingdom work and what it means to trust. So let's pray. Our gracious God, thank you so much for this wonderful day. And we thank you for all the gifts that we celebrate today. Your faithfulness, your love for us, your sacrifice for us, the hope that you give us. Lord, as you know, a lot of us feel anxiety, and we worry what's going to happen. Lord, show us how we can cast those cares to you. Lord, show us how we can seek your kingdom. Gracious God, show us what you're producing in our lives. Lord, we thank you for all your good gifts. We thank you for this community where we are. We thank you for this country where we live. We pray for those who lead us, that they'll be wise and faithful. Lord, you have given us this wonderful, beautiful world. We pray that you will give us an appreciation for it. And also, Lord, that we will be good and faithful stewards. And so, gracious God, as we go throughout our week, we pray that this Holy Week might be a time of reflection and a time of growth. Lord, I ask now that you please hear all the silent prayers which fill the hearts of these, your people. We make them one and all in Jesus' name. Amen. I will worship
Amen and thank you, Zach. And hey, Rodney, I loved what you did, playing the organ under that. That sounded fantastic. Thank you for that. Let's all stand together for our benediction. Next Sunday, Easter Sunday, looking forward to seeing you and also knowing so many of you are with us online. Until that time, go in peace. Go in the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of God's Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless you today and forever. Amen.